Lord, we just we pray right now for me, for them, for people watching. Holy Spirit, record search light. We just pray for everybody today, Lord. <laughs> just pray for friends and pray for future friends. Lord, we just pray for this, just the spirit of joy and revelation to be on us tonight in Jesus' name. And Lord, you'd show us joy that's hidden in places that we haven't even looked and treasures hidden in secret places, just joy that's, yeah, that's hidden, that's inside treasure boxes, that's sometimes we don't even know there's joy in those places. Father, we just pray for that tonight, that we would find hidden treasures of joy, secret places of darkness, and open our hearts and, and give us courage and, and perseverance and, Lord, in, encourage us, encourage us tonight. Amen. Um, this is a little different message, uh, at least for where, um, what I've been sharing for a while, and and really a little different message than, um, than we probably usually share here. And you know, something uh, happened a couple of years ago. We, Christmas is a big thing for us. Like we, we don't, I'll say Kathy's really, really good at birthdays and Christmas and Thanksgiving. I don't pretty much suck at all that stuff except for Christmas. I usually do pretty good at Christmas. I'm, can remember when Christmas is because it doesn't change. <laughs> Birthdays don't change either, but the kids keep getting, we keep getting more of them. There's a bunch of them. I can't, I can't even remember what month they were born. Now Kathy's programming into my iPhone so I could be like, yeah, tomorrow's your birthday. It's awesome. <laughs> um, but Christmas has always been a big thing for us ever, ever since I was little and, and then you, Kathy and I have kind of kept that tradition. All of our kids come to our house for Christmas, and sometimes we have Christmas uh, a couple of days early so that all of our kids can be together and also be with their, because they're married now, with their fam other families too. But, um, and we, we go all out for Christmas, and we always have. We, we used to not have anything to go out with. <laughs> I mean, we, we gave her the old college try, but we, we didn't have much money. Um, when our kids were growing up, really, we didn't have much money at all. I remember this one kind of cool testimony. It's, it's, I, I don't know if I can make it fit. I'll try, but whatever. It's still cool. We, we had no money this one year for Christmas. I think our kids were, uh, I don't know, probably, we had a, uh, probably our oldest was around 13, 14. So that would have made Jason around 9 or 10. And... Um, we had, no, we had no money for Christmas. I mean, we, I don't mean, we, we didn't have like 50 bucks. So Kathy was making things, and I remember the night, two nights before Christmas it must have been, we laid in bed and we cried, because Christmas is a big thing for us, and we're like, you know, there's nothing under the tree, and it's really tough times, and we were living in Weaverville, and it was, it was tough times for Johnson's, us, all of us, you know, we were, it was tight times for us, so. I can remember we'd put our money together with the Johnsons and get a ice cream. That was Ben and Benny used to drink, eat ice cream. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, so there was nothing for Christmas. And two nights before Christmas, we were in bed and, you know, we had decorated and, and had a tree and decorated everything. But I think there was, there was a few gifts that we had made and stuff like that. But there was really nothing. And, um, and we laid in bed, Kathy and I laid in bed together, and we, we cried, and we we're like, it's not about gifts, it's not about gifts, you know, you encourage yourself, right? It's just like, it's not about money, you know, it's about love, and we're like, yeah, but we need, we need money, <laughs> you know? Um, so, and then uh, the next, it must have been the next night, yeah, the next night we got a phone call, we had a youth group at our house, and we got a phone call, and, and uh, the pizza parlor called us and said, hey, you know, come down to the pizza parlor. We're like, what? So anyway, we go down to the pizza parlor and make a, a, a short story really long. And we get down there and Kathy had put in a ticket for this, you know those uh, video games, those stand-up full-size, like $4,000 video games? Well, she'd put in one ticket like two or three months before or something and won the video game the night before Christmas. That's cool. 
house, the biggest gift the kids ever got. Just one thing, it was kind of cool though. We had that thing for years, man. Our youth group grew over it and everything. It was awesome. So, uh, so Christmas has always, always been a really big thing for us and it's the time when we just love to give gifts and Kathy really goes all out shopping. I'm not much of a shopper, but I just give the money. And, uh, and go, that's awesome, that's awesome what you bought. So a couple years ago, um, we just really went all out and we had some extra money and Kathy just, I mean, I'm not kidding, you could barely see the tree. We made up for all the years we didn't have money. I'm like, ha, oh, are we gonna make the house payment this month? She's oh yeah, yeah, come on, don't be a Scrooge. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> and uh, so it was just really cool and you know, we put the presents under there, and of course, you know, I have eight grandkids, so they're, they're always wanting to come over and shake them and do all that stuff, you know. And so we, the, when Christmas came, we opened the gifts, and oh my goodness, it must have took us a good two and a half, three hours just to open gifts. It was like, there was paper everywhere, and of course, every time the little kids get something, they're like, they want to just run over and play with that, like the box, usually the box. <laughs> so we got all done with Christmas that that day, a couple of my grandkids, and I love them, and I, I get this, but um, they came over and they're like, Papa, we didn't get everything we asked for. <laughs> Two of them. And I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, well, I asked for this, and I didn't get that. I put it on the list, and I'm like, not my fault, you know. Gotta talk to your grandmother. <laughs> I didn't think American Express had a limit, but maybe it did. <laughs> <You know. laughs> anyway, you have to think about that. But, um, but anyway, so we had the Christmas and it, it went great and everything was fine. But uh, and everyone stays over for three or f- two or three, four days, and everyone f- left um, finally, and all of our family left. And I was just laying in bed with Kathy, and I said to her, "You know what? I don't know that it's good that our kids get everything they want." Like, I don't know that this, I, I, know what we're, I know what we're trying to do. I know we can do it. You know, when they get to be like adults, I don't know we can give them everything they want because the toys get way more expensive. But when they're younger, it's like, you know, we can give them. And, and, and I just remember, you know, of course, Kathy's like, oh, we didn't give them everything they wanted. There was like a few things on the list I didn't buy. I'm like, couldn't get them in the house or... I mean, I bought them a quad, a brand new quad, the day of Christmas. Christmas Day, I'm like, they need a quad. I went out and bought them a quad. I mean, it's bad. It was ridiculous. <laughs> then they fought over, how come we didn't get us six of them? Six of us could ride these. I'm like, yeah, whatever, okay. But anyway, I just uh, started to think about, um, from then on, I started thinking, you know, it's important for us to give, but it's also important for us to realize that we don't always get everything we want when we want it. And there's just something about, um, I, hope I, I hope I can put to words what's in my heart because I know that this could be taken both, you know, a lot of different ways and, and I could be on the other side arguing the other side of this, of course. So, um, but I, I feel like there's a piece of, of the kingdom that is really important for us to capture as we live in all this favor. And I was talking to a pastor just a, a few weeks ago, and he said to me, he, had, he has several of our, st- this pastor has a large church, and he sent several students here, and he loves us, totally loves us, and uh, we love him, we have a close relationship with him. And we were just interacting over dinner the other night, a couple, of, maybe a month ago, and he said, man, I love your school, I wanna, I wanna come again and just visit, and you know, they, they started their school after us, and, we helped them kind of get started and stuff. And he said, I love your school. I love what you guys are doing. And our students that come back, they're just totally rocked and they're changed. And he said, but can you, could you, uh, can you receive a suggestion? I'm like, yeah, t- completely. He goes, you know, um, we've sent students to your school for probably six years. And he said, he said, this is an observation. It, isn't, it wouldn't be true of every one of your students, but it's true of many of them. I said, what is that? And he said, your students are so convinced that people are going to get a miracle that they don't know anything about sacrifice and perseverance. And he's had like five of our students intern for him. He goes, your students are so convinced of miracles, which is the awesome part that he likes. He said, but if they don't get a miracle, they don't know what to do when it comes to perseverance. 
Because, and it's the, it's, the, it's the possible side effects of a culture of miracles, signs, and wonders, is that, is that you, can, you can come to this place where you, you believe if it's not instant, then it can't be God. Because you're not used to pressing in for things. And so tonight, I'm gonna, this message is a little, it's a little, it's not our core message, obviously. It's not something we would preach every week. But I wanna talk a little bit about perseverance, um, sacrifice, and suffering. And I, um, I know, it's like, Kathy's like, what are you preaching about? She looked down at the, I said, oh, I hope it's better than the title. Um, you know, the side effects of a life of miracles are the inability to embrace suffering, press through hard times, perseverance, living, uh, giving ourselves until it costs us something. And so let's turn to Romans uh, 4. Bill started this, uh, with this this morning, and it's just really been on my heart. In fact, um, I actually thought he was going to preach my message, preached a part of it. And I kind of want to just pick up uh, some of what Bill was sharing this morning and just see if I can kind of tie it together. Um, Romans 4, uh, I think it's verse 18 is what I have. Let me just see. What... Yeah, it was, uh, it was Abraham. When, when Bill was speaking this morning about Abraham and about the test of faith and, the, and about um, just how important faith is to our walk with God and how Abraham believed God for a miracle, but he got, ended up with salvation. You remember, how many of you were here for that message? By the way, if you didn't get that message, it was really an awesome message. He's talking about the dimensions of faith and Anyway, just, but he read this verse uh, as part of his text, and, and I just want to grab this one piece. He's talking about Abraham, and he's talking, and Bill described this morning, he's talking about, uh, uh, Paul's talking about Abraham, and how they were trying to have a child. Remember, they were, they were promised a child, and you remember that that got all messed up, and they end up with Ishmael. How many of you, is there, is there anyone that doesn't really know that story? I'll just tell it quickly for a few of you. There, it, so he, God promised Abraham and Sarah a child, a promised child. They go for years, and they're unable to have children. And so they decide, well, you know what? This isn't working. Sarah has a, um, you know, has a mistress, has a, a, a maid. And so she says to Abraham, well, here, go, um, you know, go, uh, you know, go take my maid and see if you can have children with her. And, um, it's probably a family argument because of the way it plays out in the Bible there. She's probably thinking, it's not my problem. I'm not the one who's sterile. It's probably you. And it seems like, it seems like I'm just reading between the lines that they're having some sort of family dispute, you know. And Abraham's like, let's try again, you know. And she's like, this isn't my problem. And so anyway, the short story is, is that Hagar, her, 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 uh, her um, what would it be, servant, her servant gets pregnant right away. So now there's a family argument. She throws a servant out. And, God, and Abraham goes to God and says, please bless Ishmael. Please make him the promise. You've given me these promises. You keep repeating them every time. I, not every time, but when I come out to pray, you show me the stars and the sky. You say, you're going to have all these kids. And then you show me the sand of the sea. And you say, you're going to have all these kids. And, and the earth is going to be blessed by my kids. And I got this one problem. I have none. Except for this Hagar, this one I have with this mistress. And and God says, listen, I'll bless Ishmael, but he's not going to be the promised child. And so they go for, was it 100? Was he like 100? Something like that. They go forever, and they have no children. And God keeps talking to him about having a child. And, and, of course, the rest of that story is God visits them when they're both really old and says, at this time next year, you're going to have a son. Uh, um, Sarah laughs. God says, why, why did you laugh? And she says, I didn't laugh. And he says, no, no, <laughs> you laughed. <laughs> and your son's name shall be Isaac, which means laughter. It's kind of a play on words. God say, no, you laughed. In fact, you'll remember that I got the last laugh because you'll name your son Isaac. <laughs> he laughed. And so, um, so anyway, they do have a son that next year and so on and so forth. But here's the, the point I wanted to make. It says, um, in hope, against hope, it's verse 18, in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoke, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, Bill uh, spoke on this this morning, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since it was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, 
and giving glory to God. And this, this is the part that I, I want to connect with tonight. In hope against hope, he believed. Now, that, that part, I think, is really, really important for our culture to get, for our young people to get, for our people who are new believers to get, and, and to realize, like, this was a huge part of our culture when, when Bill and I and our team, our young team, were growing, this hope against hope thing. It's, we're, we, now we're, I don't, I don't say it's not a part of our life now, but we have so many miracles all the time. The testimonies are huge. And, you know, Bill tells the story when we had one miracle. I remember it was a guy's arm got healed in a store that I think you prayed for. And we told that testimony for a year <laughs> or more because it's the only one we had. And, but we had, we had a whole, I don't know how many people, it, it, we had at least a couple hundred people that we had prayed for that were not, didn't get, had, nothing happened to them. Nothing, not anything. Like, you feel anything? Did your, did a twinkle, little star, anything? No, 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 I'm still the same. I mean, we did that for a lot of years. And we have one testimony, and we would repeat that testimony over and over. And I feel like, like this, what's happening here, and of course, we, we always want more. How many of you know that? And there's lots of you that are, you know, you're sitting here tonight, and you're, you know, you're sick, and you're, you're like, you know, I've been prayed for 20 times, and so I understand that you're, you're in that place. There's just a lot of us that have seen that we've created this culture, and we create expectation, and when the expectation isn't instantly fulfilled, there are some people who don't know our history. They're saying, there's something wrong. I didn't get my miracle. I went up twice. I got prayed for. I went to the healing rooms. I didn't get prayed for. And it's like, I don't know what's wrong with me. God's mad at me. Um, I've done something wrong. There's some secret sin in my life. There's, I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm a unique circumstance. I got, uh, you know, and, I, and the stories go on and on about why people feel like they're disqualified. Well, I have some kind of, you know, uh, my, my great, great, great grandfather was a mason and my, you know, my uncle was, uh, you know, a witch. And I mean, you know, as if that disqualifies you, like, so what? And, and, and we've, I think that in some of us, and even, I would even include myself in this in certain seasons, that we've lost sight of what got us here. And what got us here is in hope against hope, we continue to believe. Now, I can tell you that we've had, you know, I, I can tell you story after story of things that didn't work, about people we prayed for that died, and then the list goes, I mean, I could get you completely depressed. <laughs> I, I, I mean, sincerely, I mean, carry, we've carried, I mean, I could tell you stories that would break your heart in the early days, but we rarely ever saw a miracle. And, and we prayed for people. Uh, we had this little girl we prayed for. She, her name was, she was born with the name Faith. And I forget how long it was before we knew this, but she had a brain tumor. Oh gosh, she couldn't have been two or something when we found out. Young, she died at two. So we must have found out six months or something. I, I'm sorry, the details. This is a long time ago. This is probably 28 years ago. And and she, so you know, the family, just a real core family in our in our church. And our church was maybe a hundred people at the time. We're all really close and. This girl's, you know, she's born and her name's Faith. And of course at the time, you know, I don't remember if our wives were there, but probably they were for the birth. I mean, it's just, everybody was just in everybody's life. It was just like that. We were small, small church. And, and, um, and you know, not long after that, we find out she has a brain tumor. And we're like, well, that's why God named her Faith. Because <laughs> she's going to release Faith over our body. This is going to be our first big miracle. And man, we prayed for her, we fasted for her, and we had prophetic words that she was going to get healed. You know, I mean, we were just into this thing. I mean, we prayed around the clock. We, we did fast. We did everything. And, uh, and that little girl died. And, you know, people die here when we pray for them. We see lots of miracles. This girl died, and we were, this is like our inner core family. This is like, this is like prophetic words over her. I mean, this is, it wasn't, it was more than a death. Like, the, I believe that that day, that we made a decision that day, that brought us to this day. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it feels true to me right now. Because we made a decision, of course Bill was leading us, but I think we all had to make a decision that day if we were ever going to press in again. Because the pain was so great. And Bill carried that little girl 
in his arms, down ready, and the parents drove, and he was in the back seat carrying that little girl who had passed on to Reading, to the funeral home. And we wept for weeks, weeks over that. See, we didn't just lose a child, we lost a promise. We lost a promise. And to say it was hard would be the greatest, one of the greatest understatements that I would have ever spoken from this pulpit. It was beyond hard. I, I know it had to be really hard on Bill as, as he was our leader and we were all much younger. But to say it was hard was an incredible understatement. I mean, we mourned. We didn't just weep, we mourned for days and days. And we comforted the family and we took turns. They had one or two other kids. We took turns watching their kids, and man, it was tough. And we, we had to make a decision. I don't know that we made it that day. Maybe some of us did, maybe Bill did. But I know that over a period of that season, before that season ended, when that, when, by the time the season of grief ended, we had made a decision that we would contend for miracles, no matter how painful it was, no matter how much it costs. And that was not an easy decision. And many of you are riding the wake of that. Many of you haven't got your miracle yet. There's no statement you can make from the pulpit and speak to this many people and have it fit everybody, of course. But many of you are riding the wake of that and you don't know your history. And the history is that in hope against hope, we believed. We didn't believe because we're great people or we're like, oh, we're these, we just, Heck, I don't know how we got through it. To be totally honest, looking back, you know, it wasn't a great message. I mean, Bill, I remember we were all gathered the day that she died and gathered in this restaurant. Bill tried to speak to us and he just cried and we just cried. And I don't know if he ever said anything. I can't remember, to be honest, it was so intense. But it was, it's, it's times like that that you make a decision where, what your life is gonna mean. What's gonna, what, it would have been really, really easy. In fact, I'll tell you what, it would have been much easier to give up. It would have been much easier to develop a doctrine right there to comfort the parents. I'm really sorry, I didn't, it's been a long time since I thought about this. Don't have it written down, expect to share it. But it would have been a lot easier to develop a theology to comfort the parents and say, you know, we're not supposed to win all of them, we live in this mystery where some people are supposed to get sick and die. Because obviously the parents are like, what did we do wrong? Of course we helped them through that. You would know that. But it was, it was a tough time. And uh, I think it's really important for us to realize that we weren't born to quit. We weren't born to give up. We weren't born to retreat. And uh, we also, uh, this may be harder for some of you, we weren't born to have all the answers. We weren't born to quit because we don't have an answer, and we weren't born, this Bill's great at this and taught us this, we weren't born to create an answer when we don't have an answer, so that it comforts us. Sometimes we just have to embrace suffering. Now, I'm the guy who wrote the book on cross-carrying has became a career opportunity for some people, so this is a very weird message for me. But I think there's times when, see, here's the struggle. If you're afraid of pain and suffering, then you don't enter into the real places that need miracles. Because you don't think that you can take the result, no, it's a risk, right? So you don't think that you can take, well, I think simply put, the, a, a failure. You don't know that you can take a failure. And what I, what I think that we need to realize is that one, when, when something happens that, like that, like, just use that, that's really painful, but God gives you grace for those seasons. And you find grace in seasons that they're, they're not, like, it's not humanly, you know. See, one of the struggles I think that we have is that we look at tomorrow's challenge with today's grace. And, and if you're growing, you never have enough grace for tomorrow until you get there. That's so why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, for to each day has enough trouble of its own, which is kind of an amazing statement from Jesus. It almost sounds negative. Like, don't worry about tomorrow, you got enough problems today. 
I have faith. We're going to do Do you know what I'm getting at? Like, when you look at tomorrow's challenge with today's grace, you can't do it if you're growing. Because you don't have grace for tomorrow yet. Because you haven't got there. But if you will realize that, listen, you've got this far somehow. And I don't mean it's always been easy, but you got here. You're alive. Somebody finally paid your rent. Somebody paid your car payment. You ate. You, whatever, whatever your deal is, you went through that pain. You, you, you did that thing. Whatever you were afraid of, somehow you got here. And, and, and I'm not saying you got here, it was easy, but you got here. You arrived. And I want to propose to you that if, you, if we're afraid of suffering, now, here's the difference. I don't think that we should, I'm not talking about like, like martyrdom, where you take on a life of suffering so you can gain favor with God. That to me is weird. It says Jesus endured the cross. It doesn't say Jesus enjoyed the cross. I think that's really huge. And I want to make sure, like, that, I think that's, for me, that's the reason why I don't share this very often. Because I'm like, I don't want to create a culture where people make cross carrying a career opportunity from the standpoint that they embrace suffering to the place where they think, well, I need to suffer so Jesus will know I'm serious about a life in Christ. And I'm like, that is what I don't want. But in reacting to that, we have to make sure that we're, that we're not, that we're not, that we're not leaving a part of the gospel out. Are you with me? So I'm not talking about martyrdom. It says Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Hebrews 12. He endured the cross. Now, just to make sure that we're clear, he so endured it instead of enjoyed it that he asked Remember, he came as a sacrifice. How many scriptures in the Old Testament talk about a, a pure lamb who is going to be slain for all people, right? So, I mean, we're not talking about a guy who just died like a really, you know, he, I mean, lots of people have died a hard death, right? We've had lots of people beheaded and tortured. And I mean, Jesus wasn't the only person who's ever been tortured. He's just the only one that's ever, who was ever tortured who didn't have to be. Because he could have stopped it at any second. Listen, no one took his life, he gave it up. And before he gives it up, he prays. The night before he gives his life up, he prays. And he says this, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Now remember, he's sweating blood. I don't know what you think about that, but he's terrified. Like you would be if you knew that someone's going to nail you to a cross. He had human emotions. And he goes, Father, if there's another way to do this, if, if, there's a, if it's possible to save all these people without a crucifixion, that would be a good plan. <laughs> and I think, you know, this is my opinion. Everybody say this is Chris's opinion. I think that, you know, I think when Jesus was up in heaven, you know, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, like they're talking, they're like, yeah, that's good, I'll go down. You know, it sounded like a good idea when he was up there. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But it probably didn't sound like too good of an idea like the night before. It's like that there's another way to do this. I, I don't, listen, what I don't want to create is Christians who run around trying to get themselves crucified. That's weird to me. I just want to die. Just, oh, Jesus, just kill me. I'm like, that is not the spirit of Jesus. That's the spirit of the occult, where they cut themselves, and, they, and death is something they are so amused with. Are you following me? So it don't matter what you hear tonight, if I overemphasize something, know that I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about turning your life into a, a big, like, let's kill Chris. Let's... I just want to die. I'm talking about the avoidance of joy because I won't, I won't go through the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So on the other side of the cross, and I'm not talking about necessarily death, I'm just talking about, I'm talking about sacrifice. On the other side of sacrifice, there's a treasure of joy. And a whole bunch of us, and I, I will include myself in seasons, not my, my whole life, but in seasons, I avoid the sacrifice, and I wonder why I don't have the joy. <laughs> Are you with me? And so, and so I, I just want to talk about that a little bit. In um, Luke eleven nine, 9, you know this one well. Jesus said, I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Now, 
This verse has been taught so many times by so many different people that you would know this by now if you've been in the body for a while, that that word ask, knock, and seek is a continuum. It means keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. Jesus isn't saying, hey, anybody home? All right, you didn't get it, nobody's home. No, he's going, listen, let's just keep this up. <laughs> listen, what do I, I prayed and nothing happened, what do I do? Oh, you're not gonna like the answer. Oh, okay, what, what's that? do it differently, pray a different prayer. See, like, we don't get, it's like, no, just go back and do it again. Do what again? You said you prayed, yeah, go pray again. A different kind of way? Since they're gonna be, and it's like, we want like a magic words, like it's the magic words. Well, I know why I didn't get my miracles, because I, I went to the conference and now I learned my magic words. <laughs> I used to pray, in the name of the Father. Now I pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now I got my magic words. And now I'm okay. Now I can go back and pray and I use my magic words. Now what happens is sometimes you use your magic words and you get it. Next time you pray, you use your magic words and it works. And you're like, that's it. I just need to use my magic words. And what you don't realize is, no, you just were one prayer from getting a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> Are you with me? Are you, see where I'm talking? Somebody once said, you always find the thing in the last place you look for it. That is the stupidest statement I've ever heard in my life. Why would you keep looking after you found it? <sighs> Have you ever thought that? I always find the thing in the last place I look for it. Well, of course, because if you found it and you still look for it, we would commit you. What are you doing? I'm looking for my keys. I thought you found them. I did, but I don't want to find them in the last place I look for them. Because I always do that. So once I find my keys, I keep looking so I don't find them in the last place I looked. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Wish I would have thought. You, know. you just never know how close you are to a breakthrough. That's the point. You never know how close you are to a breakthrough. We used to, you know, um, use wood for heat in Weaverville. Yes, I know, it sounds, sounds romantic. It totally sucks. I, it's, you're freezing your butt off, it's totally cold, you're out of wood, you gotta go out in the mountains, try to find wood, the whole family's like, hope he finds wood, you know. It's just, listen, it's, it's fine if you're a rich guy and you order it in, you know, like, give me some cords, you know? But if the real reason why you're using wood is because you're broke, that ain't fun at all. And then we'd have to split these big old rounds. You know, rounds is, uh, you know, the stump. Like, you, you cut them up and you split them in. And, uh, you know, most of you won't even get this example, but it works for anyone who's ever done this before. You hit that thing, and you hit it, and you hit it, and usually, it, for me, I always wait till the last minute, so it's always freezing cold out there, because when you're out of wood, I'm like, that's why I married you. Married a mountain woman. <laughs> yeah, she, she split wood several times. Several times. I said several. Did I give you none? Huh? Many times. Whatever's more than several, she has done. She has done. But if you've ever split wood before, it, it looks, if you split a big round, it looks like this. You hit it, you hit it, you hit it, and literally your axe, I mean, your, your maul just bounces off, bounces off, bounces off. I mean, that may be 10 times, it may be 50 times. It just bounces off. And if you look at that, at that log, it looks like nothing happened. I'm dead serious. It looks like nothing happened. And I can remember when I was a flatlander. When, you're, when you stay 20 years, you're no longer a flatlander, according to the mountain people. So I'm a... I have a certification, I'm a flat, I, I am a mountain man now. I hate the mountains, but whatever. And I remember, like, I would hit this log, and this, this guy, um, I can't remember his name now, our neighbor, uh, he, he taught me how to split wood. So we're out there, we're, uh, we're, uh, Paul Garwood. We're out there, and I, I hit the thing about 15 times, and I go, dude, it won't split. He goes, you only hit it 15 times. I'm like, how, long, how often do you have to hit it? He said, till it splits. What he said, till it splits, like I'm stupid. Till it splits, of course. 
And I said, uh, I'm, you know, well, I'm from the San Jose. I'm from San Jose, right? We watched Little House on the Prairie. Seriously, seriously, watch Little House on the Prairie. Like, oh, that looks so romantic. We get in our house the first day. We moved in this house. I'm not kidding you. I bought this house. Kathy didn't go with me. I bought it by myself. Absolutely. And I brought Kathy up. She's like, oh. First winter, bought it in summer. First winter, turn the heater on. We're freezing. It's so cold that you can see our breath in the house. In the house. This is a true story. I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating to be funny. I'm absolutely, it was probably about maybe 33, 34 degrees in the house. I'm from the Bay Area. It never gets cold there. Mommy, I'm sleeping. I got in my clothes underneath about four blankets and I'm freezing and my lips are blue. I mean, so she's like, you got to turn the heater on. I'm like, all right, I'll get the, you do the, okay, I'll do the heater. Uh, You're the man, you go get the, turn the heater on. I'm like, I go, I turn the heater on. Like an hour goes by, nothing happens. Like it doesn't seem to be warming up. Like we've owned this house, you know, this is our first winter. So that morning, our neighbor comes over, big mountain guy, ponytail, 6'4", Vietnam vet, knocks on my window. Hey, Flatlander, that's what he calls me. <laughs> I come out, totally all wrapped. He goes, you must be cold in there. I go, I am. I said, I turned on the heater. He goes, heater? <laughs> there ain't even a propane tank out there, buddy. <laughs> you got a thermostat. That's all you got. There ain't no heater in that house. I've lived next door to this guy for 10 years. They don't have a heater. I said, well, how, how do you get warm? He goes, wood. Wood. Whatever. So he takes me out. We go out in the woods and we, you know, we, we get this tree and, and I mean, you hit this thing and you hit it and you hit it and you hit it and you hit it. And I'm not kidding you. It does not look you did, like you did anything to it. And all of a sudden, it might be on the 10th hit or it might be on the 100th hit. It goes whoop, and breaks in half as if it was always wanted to break in half. <laughs> I remember the first time it ever happened to me, I'm like, He's like, that's how you do it there, Flatlander. <laughs> well, first he goes, you're supposed to hit it in the same spot over and over and over. <laughs> Come it. Try it over here. Try it over there. Try it over here. He's like, no, no, it doesn't split because you do it differently. It splits when you hit it consistently in the same spot. That's just a good word right there. <laughs> How many of you have ever split a lot? Don't lie, because Jesus is watching you. <laughs> that, really? That many? All right. I know Bill and I, we've cut wood together. <laughs> Turn to Luke 18. Yeah, scary. <laughs> we hunted together until I almost shot Bill, and that was the end of that. <laughs> Remember, we were hunting birds, and Bill didn't duck. I said duck. I guess he thought I saw one. (laughs) After that, I'm like, hey, you want to go hunting? He's like, I'm busy. (laughs) Chicken. Luke 18. Jesus was telling them a parable to show them that all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Everybody say, not lose heart. And he said in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. I love Jesus' parables sometimes because he picks out people who should not be in a parable. (laughs) And he says, there was a widow in the city and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling to do it. But afterward he said to himself, even though I don't fear God and I don't respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I'm going to give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she wears me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge did. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night and will not delay long over them? I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. Listen to this. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, the context here is really interesting because he equates faith with the woman who refused to re- who refused a no. 
The judge says, no, I'm not going to give you protection. She's like, yeah, you're going to give me protection. And she just keeps going back. And Jesus said, listen, listen, I want you to learn to pray and not lose heart, but I'm concerned that you have faith, and faith is directly connected to the story. In other words, faith means not that you have this great feeling like, I'm going to get a breakthrough, I just know it, but that you keep going back. That you keep going back. And he goes, listen, this was a wicked judge. And he's like, my father's like that. Not wicked, but if you wear him out, he'll give you what you want. I don't know if it meant quite like that, but that's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting parable that she literally wore the wicked judge out. And he goes, if you keep persisting, my father will give you what you want. But I'm concerned you have faith. When I come back, am I going to find people who have faith? And what he means is, am I going to find people that won't give up and lose heart? And he, and he equates faith with people who don't lose heart. What do you do if you don't get an answer? You keep trying. Well, I'm going to need some magic words. Well, maybe you need magic words, and maybe you need training, and maybe there's a reason. That's all good. You know, sozo, training, quipping. We have a whole school that does it. It's, it's all good. But listen, you're never going to get past. You get all the words right, you get all the training, you get all the equipping, you get all that stuff, you still have to keep hitting the log till it splits. Well listen, tell me, uh, in your training, how many times exactly does it take for the log to split? Until it splits. See, I, I want to, listen, if it's going to be a hundred times, that's fine. I just want to know it's a hundred. I mean, no, if you're with me. Like, if it's going to be, if I know it's a hundred, if I know that this trial is going to last one year, as long as I know it has an end, good to go. What bothers me is I don't. I don't know when it's going to end. I don't know when the log's going to split. I don't know. I just know that if I keep it up, it will. And there's something that we, that we have to revisit. I, I think all of us really, I do, gosh. I'm the one preaching this, and I'm like, you got some areas in your life, you, you got, I got some logs over there that aren't split, I'm like, too much work. <laughs> I'm not that cold yet. <laughs> I got other wood. We used to do that too, though. You do that too. You get hard ones, you put them over there, and then you know what happens? <laughs> yeah, that's right. A man's cold body will egg him on. Proverbs says something like that. <laughs> he says, and Proverbs says, a man's hunger urges him on. And you get cold enough, you're like, yeah, you know what, those, those big logs, they look pretty good right now. I'm going to go out there and give her another try. And, and sometimes, you know, honestly, we're just not desperate enough. I, I don't mean it in an evil way. I don't mean like, I just mean we have other options. We have other options. So we're like, you know what, that's, that problem right over there, I got a bunch of them over here I can solve. Keeps my confidence up. <laughs> can give a testimony every week. <laughs> At some point, that one keeps coming back. And you're like, all right, here we go, you know? Where do I hit it? And, and the truth is, the truth is, and we're, we're using log here as a parable. You got the parable? It is true that you can read a log after a while. You learn to read a log. It's true. And, and, you, and you learn that if you, if you turn the log a certain way and you watch the grain and you read the log, you can... It doesn't mean you're going to get on the first hit or even the tenth. You still may have to go 50 times. But you would have to do 100 if you don't know the law. You don't know how to read the law. So there is something to training and equipping. If you're with me. There's something that, there's something the old mountain men can teach you. And, and my, my friend didn't teach me that for the first two months. I'd go out and cut with him. <laughs> I said, how do you do it so quick? He said, oh, I'm just so much stronger than you. What do you say to me? You're a wimp, man. You're a, you're, a, you're a flatland. You're a city boy. So one day we're out there and he's like, look, look. See the grain right here? See that? See there's a knot there. See that knot? Yeah. Yeah. That's a 200 hitter right there. But if you turn it this way and you hit it like that, it's going to split better. I said, why didn't you tell me that two months ago? Because you needed to build up your muscle and strength. Well, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because the first, the, it was interesting the way he trained me because at first he didn't care whether I split the log because it's more about me than it was about getting wood. 
fact, he used to bring me wood over. He goes, ah, oh, piles get low, here's a bunch of wood. Because I need to get stronger. Don't matter if you could read the log or not. I'm not so sure that sometimes the Lord is trying to, mm, let me say it differently. Let me rethink how I'm gonna say this. External processors can, can get it right. We can internally process, we're just not trained to. <laughs> sometimes I think that the Lord is more interested in the work he's doing in us than the work he's doing through us. Sometimes, sometimes. So, lots of good work. <laughs> Does it seem funny to you, like, to wear God out? I'm like, what are you doing? I'm wearing God out. <laughs> I'm not a 24-7 prayer guy, but I'm wearing God. I got a problem. I'm just going to keep going back. Did, did you get a prophetic word? No. Saw the Bible. I'm wearing this guy out. <laughs> He's going to be so tired of seeing me, he's going to answer my prayer. <laughs> Doesn't it seem to be saying that almost? It's like... Oh, here comes Chris again. Lord, just give me what I want. It'll be cool. It's awesome. Anyway, anybody ever remember the old Rocky movies? I know. If this was Danny, he'd have the, I don't know how to do all that stuff. I just know how to put the video in, but I don't know how to get it to the place where you could see it. So... Do you remember when, when Rocky fights the Russian? Hey, if there's anyone who's Russian in here, dude, I'm, I'm good with you all. It's just an example. It's during the Cold War, and you, you guys were the bad guys then. You're not the bad guy anymore. <laughs> anyway, if we could move on. The Russian's a really big guy, you know, Rocky's really little, especially the way they shoot the, the movie and stuff. And so, and, and he just, and do you remember this at all? And he gets in the ring with, with this great big guy, and the guy goes, I'm going to kill you. Which I don't know if that's Russian or not, if that's how Russians speak. He goes, I'm going to destroy you. And so, and then, and then he gets in the ring with him, and he's like, really, it's like David and Goliath, right? And he just keeps in... And Rocky just keeps going over, and first he gets knocked down a few times, and he's really discouraged, he's in the corner, he's like, and his manager's all, he's killing you, he's like, I know, I know, he's killing me, you know, he's like, do you want me to throw in a towel? No, no. And about the third round, the guy hits him, and he's like, and he gets, he gets this thing on him, in the movie. I know, it's just a movie. I, I know, I get it. But I think the reason why everyone loves the movie is because everyone's been there before. Where you just like you just you're just discouraged. You just get knocked down. You get knocked down. You get knocked down, and you're like you're just about ready to give up. And you know, and someone says you want me to throw in the towel, and you're like, you know what? This guy's starting to make me mad. And he gets out there, and 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 in the movie, and he just and he goes, hit me, go ahead, hit me. And the guy hits him, and he falls down. And he gets back up. He's hit me, and he chases the guy around, and and, the, and it's like, like by the sixth or seventh round, you know, he's hit him like you know in the movie. It's so exaggerated. It's like he's knocked him down like a hundred times, you know. And he and he the the, the uh, Russian goes over into the corner, and, and sits down, and he goes, "He's not human." <laughs> Do you remember that part? He's not human. And then, and, and so about the seventh or eighth round, he's just get knocked down, he's all bloody, doesn't even look like he's human, you know, it's just the whole movie thing. And the, and the manager turns to his, to his father-in-law, and he goes, because he keeps going, go ahead, hit me, go ahead, hit me. And the guy hits him, knocks him down, and, go ahead, hit me again, go ahead, hit me again. And so finally, the manager turns to his, his father-in-law and goes, what is he doing? And the, and the, and the father-in-law goes, winning. And finally, it's like, you know, way into the, the, the round, and the, and the guy, and the big guy, just wore, he's just wore out. And Rocky hits him. And when he hits him, he's like, the guy falls back, and he's, he's, he's I know, this is too graphic. <laughs> Boxing's in the Bible. Paul said it, the Bible. So this is all right. He, <laughs> ultimate fighting is not, but boxing is. He hits him, and, and, he, and he's the first time he's ever been hurt. And he goes, and, he, and his manager starts yelling, he's human, he's human. And of course, Rocky wins. And then the United States and Russia, that's when the, cold, when the, the Iron Curtain fell, right after the Rocky movie, because we made Rocky in the 
big guy made friends and it was all good. And of course, the Americans won because we're the good guys, of course. <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> Despite popular opinion these days, we were the good guys in the movie. So we should win because we're Americans. <laughs> and for, if you're from another country, isn't it good that you came here and got educated? <laughs> These are things you won't learn in other schools. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you know that I'm being sarcastic, right? I'm just being funny, okay. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter four start landing here in a minute. Verse 5. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as bond servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there, no, I'm sorry. For God who said, let, start over. For God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who is shown, shown he's shining, he's shown in our hearts, <laughs> it's just bad when you, why did he pick me? I don't know. We need to do this one again. For God, for, for God who said, light shall shine in the darkness, is the one who shone in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Verse seven, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of power would not be, would, would, power would be of God and not of ourselves. For we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not despairing. We're persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. We're always carrying around the body of this dying Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over for death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our moral flesh, in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life works in you. I wanna just read that last part, but we have this earth and we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not ourselves. For we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. Everybody, anyone ever been perplexed? We are perplexed, but we are not despairing. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. We're always caring about, we are always caring about in the body of the dying Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, so that life can work in you. And sometimes it's just like that. Sometimes we just have to press through with people. It's funny, uh, I was actually gonna start with this verse. Uh, out of Hebrews where it says, Hebrews 13, six says, do not neglect doing good and sharing for such sacrifices God is pleased with. Do not neglect doing good and sharing for such sacrifices God is pleased with. And the word sharing there is the word fellowship. Let me just read it with the word fellowship in there. Do not neglect doing good and fellowship for such sacrifices God is pleased with. Sometimes fellowship is a sacrifice. And fellowship isn't an acquaintance. Fellowship is when you build a friendship with someone. And it, no, let me say, let me say this, that includes this. Fellowship is sometimes when you build a friendship with someone who can't give you back what you need, but can only take what they need. I'm not saying that's all of fellowship, but it's a part of fellowship. A part of fellowship is when you build a friendship with somebody who's needy. Now, I'm not talking about like they're mentally needy and they're just looking to someone to suck off of. I'm not talking that that's healthy. You know, Danny would teach us that, that that's a codependent relationship. 
I'm talking about people who truly can't repay you because they truly can't repay you. And yet, you have fellowship with them. You've brought them into the inner circle of your life, and you're giving to them, and it's painful, and it's a sacrifice. And, and God says, if you're in a relationship like that with people, it pleases him. It pleases him that you would suffer for somebody. It pleases him that you would be inconvenienced for someone else. It pleases him that you would live a life that you would sacrifice some of your comfort so someone else could be comforted. Now, let me, let me demonstrate a contrast. We'll be done here in probably 10 minutes. If you have a lot, see, if you have a, more than you need, you can, you know, it could be money, it can be emotional strength, it could be whatever. If you have more than you need, then when you give to somebody, that's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice means it has to cost you something. See, anyone can give away something expensive, but only people who understand sacrifice can give away something valuable. And David said it this way, and I've shared it a couple times in the last few months, it's been close to my heart, and actually you can read it, um, I'm sorry, you can read it in, um, I'll give you the scripture here. You can read it in 2 Samuel 24, but it's the story of David when he gets in trouble with God, and the prophet comes to him, and he goes, what do I have to do to break this famine off the land, this curse off the land? And, and the, the prophet says, listen, what you have to do, God says, go down and buy this guy's property, build an altar, and give God a sacrifice, and the curse will be broken. So he goes down, this is famous, you've probably heard the story, he goes down to the guy's property, he goes down to buy the guy's property, the guy's really wealthy, he goes, David, listen, you're the king, man, you can have the property, no big deal. And David makes this profound statement. He said, far be it from me that I should offer to God something that costs me nothing. Now, now, how many of you know that the guy's rich? I mean, he just wants to give it. And there are times when we've got to get out of the poverty mentality and just be able to receive it because people need to give. But there's other times when, we, when God goes, no, 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 let's, don't take advantage of this man's wealth. I want it to cost you something. I want this relationship to cost you something. And I'll use this example in my book about virginity. It's like, why do you have a sex drive years before God wants you to have sex inside of covenant? Because the value of your virginity is in the blood, sweat, and tears it takes to get it from the battlefield all the way to the honeymoon suite. So then on your honeymoon night, you have something to offer your lover that you had to actually fight to keep. See, there's, are, you, are you getting It's like sacrifice is written right into love. So you can sacrifice and not love. But you cannot love and not sacrifice. There's lots of martyrs out there that, you know, first, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you can give your body to be burned, you can do all this stuff and not have love. So you can sacrifice and not have the motivation be love. But you cannot love and not sacrifice. It is impossible to love and not sacrifice. That's why it says, God so loved the world that he, next part, gave. You can't love and not, you, if you love, you're going to give. You're going to have to give. And listen, when you have more than enough, that's awesome. Listen, it's awesome. I, I, you know, I, I've been in lots of t seasons lately where financially, like, I have more than enough. It's like, it's like write the check, no big deal. And, and it's good. And it's, there's nothing evil about it. And we get credit for it in heaven and all that. But God loves it when you give something that actually costs you. you. You know what I mean? Both times it costs you. It costs you personal comfort. Like you had to give up something to give it. Right? And for some of us, it's a lot easier to, to die for God than it is to live for Him. And for a lot of us, it's a lot easier to give the money than it is to give the time. In certain seasons of our life, that's just totally true, isn't it? And, and so sometimes we're like, you know, you could, you could buy that meal or, or you could make one or you could, you, you know what I'm trying to say? It's like you could solve this problem two, two ways and you've got plenty of money you're like, I'll just pay for it. And God goes, no, no, I want you to, and you're like, that's going to take me three hours. I'm going to take most of my day. And the Lord's all, yeah, that's the one I really like. I like the one where you, it costs you something. I'm like, ah, why? When I can solve the problem without it cost me something, the Lord, because this isn't about the log. This is about you. 
This is about something developing in you. It's not about the log. I'm not concerned about you warming the house. I'm concerned about you warming the heart. And I don't mean that whole, every, you know, gosh, I would not want you to take this to me. Like, unless you're you know, living this life where every day is just like, oh, God, just, who else can I, you know, lay it down for? You know, it's like, ah, oh, you know, please, can we not do that? But you can't, you can't live a life where it's not part of your life. It's just not the kingdom. Are you with me? There's no such thing as a kingdom life without suffering. I'm not talking about daily, every day, like I made my life a big suffering. But I mean, there's no such thing as a kingdom life without some suffering. If you don't ever suffer, it's because you've avoided places where Jesus wanted you to minister. You know, like, that looks too painful. And the Lord's all, would you stop being afraid of pain? I am bigger than pain. I'll finish with this story. I wrote this little phrase. I like it, so I'll read it to you. True love germinates, true love germinates in the soil of sacrifice, sprouts in the garden of surrender, and matures in the matrimony of servanthood. Love isn't love until it costs you something to give it away. I'm gonna tell you a story. In September 2005, a gal, a young gal came to our school. Her name was Kirsten from Switzerland. And she, uh, she found this guy they, you know, it's, I don't know, it's Chris Valentin's supernatural dating school. It's terrible. I, something I've repented of nearly seven, eight times a day since I've been here. Like people who quit smoking like 5,000 times. But um, I just love to see people get together and get married. It's just, I don't know, my angel's Cupid. <laughs> Daniel had Gabriel, I had Cupid. We don't beat anybody up, but we sure get people connected. <laughs> so anyway, whatever. So, so Kirsten meets Ty, uh, Tyson, and they start this relationship, and, and um, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful to watch them, and I, I, I didn't know them really well, but well enough that I knew their names, and I've watched them, and I had a meal with them a couple of times, and Paul was really close to him, so, um, you know, always kind of hearing the news and all excited, you know, the wedding and all that. And, and it was just like, this is like one of those, you know, have you ever seen people that are kind of hopeless romantics? And like when you watch them, you're like, you fall in love all over again. Like, like watching their, their, their life was like watching a movie for me. It's like, ha, oh, I need to do that with Kathy, you know? <laughs> Appropriately and all that. So... And it was just really cool, and, and early on in their, in their marriage, they were both in school ministry, and early on in their marriage, um, she got pregnant, somehow, when they were married. <laughs> and they were just elated, you know, we were all elated, we were all excited, and, and she wins the Emerald Johnson Award, which we give to only two students in each class. And she wins the Emerald Johnson Award, I mean, she's our star student, you know, she's, you know, bigger than life, romantic, just beautiful, beautiful, she's beautiful, he's good looking. It's like Barbie and Ken, you know, it's like a love story. It's like, it's like you, know, you ever just root for people? You just, just some people are like, yeah, you just want them to win, you know? Like Rocky. <laughs> and Adrian, you know, it's just, you just want them to win. <laughs> Adrian! <laughs> That's, what, that's when they wrote that song, you know? I know you're out there somewhere. Somewhere. Anyway. So, I was just, they were just having this amazing life, and, you know, it was just amazing. And then uh, one day, I, I, I forget the details, to be totally honest. I'm really bad at details. I'm bad at dates, names, details, and faces. <laughs> Besides that, I have an awesome memory. Sometimes I tell testimonies and Kathy will be like, that was three testimonies all mixed up in the one. I was sweating the record search like interviewing me because they'd like go back and investigate and find out like that was like, that was like four different people you shared about me. I got some better ones that were only one person. I just don't remember them. So anyway, someplace along the way, 
she, she got sick or there was a problem, some kind of a problem, and she went to the doctor. It may have been in her in a regular checkup or something. Honestly, I don't remember the details. But they find out, they find out there's something wrong with her, so they do some more uh, tests, and the short story is they find out she has fourth stage cancer all through her body. Ah, here we go. Why did I end with this story? This is stupid. <laughs> Should have stuck with the Rocky story. It is such a great story. Just have to keep on going. Oh, let's keep going. So she has four stage cancer, and the doctor says to her, you know, she, I forget how long, I think she's like four months pregnant. And the doctor says to her, you know, we, we, this cancer you have is medically curable. Like it has a high cure rate if we give you chemo right now there's a really good chance that, that you'll be cured and it will not return. It's, just, it's that kind of a cancer. But it will kill the baby. So you need to have an abortion so that we can do this chemo on you and save your life. And she just told the doctor, no way. I'm not taking the chemo. If that, if those are the two options. I won't take the chemo. He said, if you wait five more months, there's no question you will die. The, the cancer will have taken over your body and you will die. So those were the two options. And uh, right there in the doctor's office, her and Tyler said, no, I'm, I want this baby to live. And the baby was born five months later and I think it was two or three months later that Kirsten passed away. That's a sad story, and yet, in a strange way, not in a way that sickness is supposed to kill people, that's the part we don't like. I have no sermon for that. I don't know why that happened. We prayed just like we prayed for everyone else who got healed, more, probably, oh, no question, not probably, no question, much more. More often, more people fasted, everything. But we lost that battle. And she, and she went on to be with the Lord, and Tyson now has this little girl. Boy. <laughs> it had different parts than I remembered. <laughs> yep. The boy's name is Kalani. And it means heavenly. Yeah, isn't that cool? But sometimes we just have to give up our lives so that someone else could have one. And sometimes, well, we don't, we don't want a bunch of you like, you know, doing that kind of thing, but it just was so interesting, Kirsten's um, attitude. Like, I talked to her right I think it was within a week or so, the doctor's appointment. She's just like, I am not sacrificing my baby so I can live. And she's like, I, I, I'm willing to die so that my baby can live. That is part of the kingdom. Not the sickness part, but the part where we lay down our life so that someone else can live. And now the spirit of Kirsten's on that heavenly child. And a legacy is going to be born. Why don't you stand? I know, you're probably like me, like, I wish I would have ended on the Rocky story. It's a poor choice. But maybe I was supposed to end on this story. Some of you are going through a really hard time. I could feel it. I've been feeling it for weeks. And, you know, you could always say that. It's always true. You get, you get a crowd of three people together, like, one of you? I feel like one of you is going through a hard time, but that, you know, come on. Hello. But I feel like the Lord wants to encourage you, like, just keep pressing in. Like, just, just, keep, just keep praying. Just listen. I feel like for a whole bunch of you, like, you just need to hear, like, there's nothing wrong. Just keep getting prayed for. Just keep, keep going to the same line. Maybe you just need to keep going to the same person. I, I don't want it to be a formula. The point I want to make here is that just keep trying. God calls it faith. You're like, 
like, I've been prayed for so many times, I don't even believe anymore. If you go get prayed for, you must believe. No, you're like, well, I don't. That's why I don't get prayed for. No, 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 you're not understanding me. If you let someone pray for you, you may not feel like you have any faith, but the act of allowing someone to pray for you means you have faith or you're crazy. Are you following me? Just letting someone pray for you. I don't even know this is going to work. The, the fact that you let someone pray for you means there's a glimmer in there somewhere that he says, Isaiah 53, he's not going to put it out. A dimly burning wick. He's not going to put it out. So just keep, keep praying. Keep trying. Like, don't give up hope. And if you lose a battle, okay, then you have to make a choice. Okay, I lost that battle. Am I never going to fight for that again? I think those are the times, like I watched Bill go through this. We all did in some level, but nothing like Bill did when his, when his father died. You know, he's told the stories. Best, in my opinion, the best message of Bill's life was the, the Sunday before his father passed on and the Sunday after. It, it was, you know, just, in, I mean, for me, for my own life. It just, it's so demonstrated what we learned in Weirville, in my, in my opinion. It's like, okay, you lose one, that's, that right there, those are the defining moments of our life. Those are the times, listen, uh, maybe this is uh, too far of a stretch. Some of you have a relationship, like you're looking for a, a husband, you're looking for a wife, you're looking for, you, you understand what I'm saying, and it, the, the, it didn't work out. The first one didn't work out. I don't mean necessarily marriage or whatever, but you're like, I'm never going to go through that again. It's too painful. I'm never going to give my heart again. It's like, no, 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 listen. These are the defining moments of our life. What do we do when it didn't work? What do we do when we're confronted with a failure? When we, when we hope against hope, we believe, and it didn't happen. What, those, those are the difference between people who become uh, in, in, uh, great in the kingdom and people who, who, who go on with disillusion written over their head and they make a choice that God somehow has some shifting evil in him and it, it, it just doesn't, nobody just knows about it. It's like there's just something, there's God is mostly good, but this little piece, and, and listen, that... When you come to conclusions like that, it robs you, not just of that incident, but it robs you of the rest of your life. God is good all the time. Well, why did this happen? I don't know I have an explanation for that. When you get to heaven, you can ask him. You get to sit down and talk to him. But listen, don't do this. Don't decide that because it didn't happen, it's not ever going to happen again. Because that's how you get old and stop dreaming. And that's why it says in Acts 2.17, old men are going to dream again. And again, if I could say it this way, old women too. You're going to dream again when the Holy Spirit comes upon you because you're going to like, I'm going to believe. I'm going to be like Abraham. And hope against hope, I'm going to believe. And I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to break that log. I'm going to break through that problem. I'm not going to live in poverty all my life. I'm going to find the, the person of my dreams. I'm going to get that job. I'm going to get well. I'm going to get healed. I'm going to, I'm going to get that position. Whatever it is, I'm going to keep going until it kills me. And if it does kill me, then I'm going to go to heaven. And when I go to heaven, I'm going to say, listen, you didn't, listen, you didn't answer my prayer. He's like, well, at least you had faith. So well done, good and faithful servant. And you're going to be in heaven. And probably you live in a bigger mansion than whatever. I don't know what that all is about. I just know you'll get a reward for it because you believed. And you know, Hebrews 11 says that there were people who had promises that God didn't fulfill. And he had a reason for that. And I don't want to be one of those people. But you know, there may be areas in our life where, where, there, where God goes, I'm going to fulfill this on the other side. And it's like, whatever, just keep believing. Listen, you can't go wrong with, with believing God and knowing that he's always good, and that whatever happened, however it looks, on this side of, 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 of heaven, it's still for good. I don't know why, but it's still for good. And maybe God works some of these things out in eternity. Who knows? I don't know. But I know this. Don't change the nature of God when you don't understand. Because that's a great way to fall into a hole that you can't get out of. And I meet with people, including leaders, all the time. And I see the word disillusioned over them. I'm like, okay, tell me about that. Well, you know, yeah, and we all have those stories. I have, you want some of those? I got some of those too. You have to make a decision. I'm gonna trust God, I'm gonna believe he loves me, and somehow this is all gonna work out for good even though he didn't cause it. It's gonna work out for good. 
Somehow, in the, maybe in the other side. It's gonna work out for good. But, but right now, I have all these other ones that I need to make sure I get a victory in. Because I don't want this to become a pattern in my life. Like failure is not gonna be a pattern in my life. I'm gonna lose some battles, but I am gonna win the war. And so I want, us, I want you to just, I guess, yeah, just leave your hands, just leave your heads up. If you're, if you're like, you're in the middle of suffering, you feel disillusioned, and you're like, man, I needed this tonight. Uh, not to encourage me, I want to pray for you. I want you to raise your hand right now. I want you to raise your hand. Okay, just leave your hand up. The people that are around you, would you put your hands on these folks uh, in an appropriate place, on their shoulder or something, their head? Leave your hand up until you have a, a couple people praying for you. Leave your hand up until you have a couple people praying for you. Okay, now, okay, listen, listen don't pray yet. I want to tell you what I want you to pray. I feel like the Holy Spirit has dropped it in my heart just maybe 20 seconds ago. There is something called a gift of faith. It's 1 Corinthians 12, a gift of faith. And it's what happens, it's what you need when you don't have faith for it anymore and God's going to give you his faith. You got it? So I want you, you that are praying, I want you to pray, and you can pray some other stuff too, but at least include this. Holy Spirit, I release the gift of faith in this person to believe for this circumstance right now. And then you want to pray for their broken heart, all that stuff you would probably know. Pray for their disillusion, broken heart. Pray positive, okay? Make sure nothing, nothing negative, okay? So I want you to pray for these people right now. And I'm going to finish uh, the prayer in probably two or three minutes. But go ahead and just pray for them right now. So it's going to be quiet for a couple minutes. Don't get nervous. Go ahead and just go after it. Go, go after it in their lives. You can be violent about it. You don't have to be quiet, but I meant I was going to be quiet. You're doing great. Just keep going after it. You're doing great. People are having serious encounters right now. I can just feel it in the room. You that are watching by, by Bethel TV, just if there's someone in the room, have them pray for you. Pray for yourself. In the overflow room, same thing. Keep praying. If you run out of things to pray, pray in the Spirit. Pray, with, pray in tongues because the Holy Spirit will know what to pray when you run out of things to pray. You're doing good. There's breakthrough happening in people's hearts. I can feel it all around the room. Go deeper. Go deeper with the same prayer. Just go deeper with the same prayer. You don't have to come up with a different one. Just pray it again over them if you need to. Keep going. Another minute. I just feel like we're supposed to stay with this for another minute. Pray in the Spirit if you run out of words. Just pray in the Spirit over them. It's, it's, it, it's really powerful. Pray over, pray over them in the Spirit. About 30 more seconds.
There's a strong breakthrough right now in the area of marriage. Okay, let, let, me, let me pray now. Go ahead and just wind yours up and let me pray for these folks. It, um, marriage, it, uh, something to do with marriages. Um, some of you, some of you this, uh, we, we, I don't need details, but you're praying right now with regard to the context we were talking about tonight, and it has to do with your marriage. Would you raise your hand? It has to do with your marriage. Raise your hand. Leave your hand up for a minute because I'm going to pray for you right here. Holy Spirit told me that he is, there's a breakthrough. That log's about to break in the area of marriage, in your marriage. And, and, the, and right now I just release by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power invested in me in God, I release a breakthrough in the area of, of your marriage. That the Lord would heal your marriage, that he would restore, that a spirit of reconciliation would literally go out over the congregation and out over Bethel TV and out into the different places where people are listening and, and the Lord would begin to reconcile and restore relationships in the name of Jesus and hope against hope. Lord, we just release that right now in Jesus' name. Some of you that have your hands raised need to pray for your miracle in your own heart. Maybe there's a, a shift that needs to happen in you. Maybe there's a, a miracle that needs to happen in your own heart as well as your partner's heart. So Lord, we just pray for that, that shift right now in Jesus' name. Go ahead and put your hands down. Um, there's, uh, I, this is probably going to apply to several people. I saw a woman with three miscarriages. And you're, and you, you're just like, you, there's been so much pain, you're like, I, I can't do this again. And uh, I felt like the Lord said, the, this is it right here. You've populated heaven, now you're going to populate earth. And if you've had a miscarriage, and, 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 you, and you want a baby, and you're willing to raise your hand, I understand there is a little... Um, I don't want to embarrass you. I just don't know another way to do this. Just raise your hand if, if that's you. Right here. You, you want a baby. You've had a miscarriage. Okay, good. There's some folks right there. Is there anyone else? Someone had several miscarriages. Like, like I, I, got, I got really had someone with three miscarriages. We have overflow room too. That's you guys? Okay, cool. Okay, if you've had a miscarriage, just raise your hand. We're going to pray for you right now. And you, want to get, and you want to have babies. You want to have babies. Okay, cool. Lord, we just release right now. Let the womb of these women open. And we pray for protection over these children right now. Let the gestation period let, let go to full term. Let the children be completely healthy. There's, oh, there's several people. Um, I, I, there's, man, there's a real huge, huge, huge draw on this. Even though more people have their hands raised for the other, there's a huge draw on this right now. And Lord, we just release that over people who are watching in the overflow rooms right now. Lord, for, for people who have miscarriages and they're just, the pain's been so great, Lord, we just pray that you'd heal their hearts right now. We pray that you'd heal their hearts, that you'd heal their hearts right now. Husband and wife, that you would heal both their hearts right now. And Lord, that you would impregnate them over the next couple of months and that they would come to full term, have healthy children in Jesus' name and that this pattern would be broken over them right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Lord. This is kind of a weird one, but someone, uh, somebody in here has had several car accidents. Like, you've had so many car accidents, it's like, it, it literally feels like you're a magnet. And many of them have not been your fault. Like, most of them have not been your fault. But it's like you're just almost terrified to drive. Who is that? The Lord's healing that right now. Lord, we just release right now. We, just, we break the power of any kind of a curse that would be over these people in Jesus' name. We cancel that assignment to take out these people's lives. And Lord, we put a wall of protection around their automobiles. And even at stop signs where people would run into you when you stop and you were just totally completely, even parked. Lord, we just, we break the power of that thing. We reverse the magnet and we cause it to repel people who would try to hit them. In Jesus' name, that from this day forward, there would be no more car accidents in their lives. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Man, we could just go on and on tonight. I'll leave you this last phrase. Cy Rogers made this statement. I wrote it down. He said, you'll never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. You'll never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. Wow, such a great statement. You'll never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. Listen, do not let pain keep you from pursuing. 
Do not let pain keep you from pursuing. In Jesus' name.